Hi everyone, it's Professor Crimpton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on addition and subtraction formulas. So in the previous video, we talked about how to use the sum and difference formulas for the sine, cosine, and tangent functions. In this video, we're going to talk about how to use the sum and difference formulas to verify identities. So let's pick up where we left off. Example 4, proving a trigonometric identity. Establish the following trigonometric identities using the addition and subtraction formulas. So number 1, we're going to prove this identity. Cosine of theta subtract phi divided by the quantity sine of theta times sine of phi is equal to cotangent of theta times cotangent of phi plus 1. We're going to start with the left-hand side of the trigonometric identity because it involves the subtraction formula for the cosine function. So we have cosine of theta subtract phi, and then it's divided by sine of theta times sine of phi. Well, in the previous video, we talked about the difference formula for the cosine function. Cosine of theta subtract phi is cosine of theta times cosine of phi, and then plus, so in other words, if it's a difference formula for the cosine function, it's a sum of two different terms, and then you also have sine of theta times sine of phi, and we'll keep the denominator the same. It'll be sine of theta times sine of phi. Now if you want to establish this identity, notice you have two terms in the numerator. You have cosine theta, cosine phi is one term, and sine of theta times sine of phi is the other term, and you have a common denominator of sine of theta times sine of phi. Let's rewrite this one fraction into a sum of two fractions. So one fraction will be cosine of theta times cosine phi divided by the LCD or common denominator of sine of theta times sine of phi, and the second fraction will be sine of theta times sine of phi divided by sine of theta times sine of phi. So one fraction we have is cosine theta, cosine phi, divided by sine theta, sine phi. Well, that can be simplified. We have cosine theta divided by sine theta, that's one fraction. And we have cosine phi divided by sine phi, that can be another fraction that's being multiplied together because you multiply the numerators and you multiply the denominators separately. And now notice, in this other fraction, you have sine of theta, sine of phi, divided by sine of theta, sine of phi, that's just one because you're multiplying in the numerator and also multiplying in the denominator. And so you have cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. We know that's cotangent of theta. Cosine of phi times sine of phi, that's cotangent of phi. And then the other term or the other fraction was just one. So we have cotangent theta, cotangent phi, and then plus one. That's exactly what we were trying to establish on the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. So we've proved the trigonometric identity. We start with the left-hand side of the identity and we use a series of algebra steps and trigonometric identities to actually establish the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. Number two, let's establish this identity. Sine of x plus y subtract sine of the quantity x subtract y is equal to two times cosine of x times sine of y. So notice on the left-hand side, you actually have the sum and also the difference formulas for the sine function. So the left-hand side contains the addition and subtraction formulas. We're going to start with the left-hand side of this trigonometric identity. So sine of the quantity x plus y is the addition formula for the sine function. We know that sine of x plus y is equal to sine of x cosine of y plus, because it's the addition formula for the sine function, sine of y times cosine of x. And then we have subtraction sine. And then we have sine of the quantity x subtract y. Well, that's the difference formula for the sine function. And that formula was sine of x cosine sine of y and then subtract sine of y and then cosine of x. Now be a little careful because you have a subtraction before the sine of the quantity x subtract y. So we're rewriting the sine of x subtract y as a difference using the difference formula. Well now this negative sign is going to be distributed to both terms because we rewrote one expression involving the sine of x subtract y is now two terms. So it's really subtract both terms. So you'll have to distribute the negative sign to both terms inside the square brackets. So you have sine of x cosine of y plus sine of y cosine of x subtract sine of x cosine of y and then plus sine of y times cosine of x. Now notice you have sine of x and cosine of y and you also have negative sine of x cosine of y after you distribute the negative sign through the square brackets. That will just give you zero after you collect like terms. And then the other two terms you have are sine of y cosine of x and sine of y cosine of x. They're identical. They're like terms. So you actually have two of them. So sine of y cosine of x plus sine of y cosine of x, that's two sine of y cosine of x. And that's exactly the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. So this proves the trigonometric identity. Sine of the quantity x plus y subtract sine of the quantity x subtract y using the addition and subtraction formulas for the sine function is equivalent to two times sine of y times cosine of x. Number three, this time we have the sum and difference formulas for the cosine function. So we have cosine of the quantity x plus y times cosine of the quantity x subtract y, and we're gonna show that it's equivalent to cosine squared of x subtract sine squared of y. 
So again, the left-hand side contains the addition and subtraction formulas for the cosine function. So we're going to start with the left-hand side of the trigonometric identity. So cosine of the quantity x plus y, that's the addition formula for the cosine function. So that was cosine of x, cosine of y, subtract, because that's part of the addition formula for the cosine function. It's a subtraction, sine of x, times sine of y. So we rewrote cosine of x plus y as the difference of these two terms, cosine x, cosine y, subtract sine x, sine y. And now we're going to rewrite cosine of x subtract y using the difference formula for the cosine function in the same way. Cosine of x times cosine of y plus, because that's the difference formula for the cosine function, it's a sum of two terms. And then we also have sine of x and also sine of y. So cosine of the quantity x subtract y becomes two terms. It's cosine x, cosine y plus sine x, sine y. And so now notice we have one factor with two terms times another factor with two terms. You actually have a binomial times a binomial. We can use a FOIL method to expand or multiply it out. Cosine x times cosine y times cosine x times cosine y. The first two terms multiplied together will give you cosine squared of x times cosine squared of y because cosine x times cosine x gives you cosine squared of x and cosine y times cosine of y gives you cosine squared of y. And now if you multiply the outside two terms, cosine x times cosine y times sine x, sine y is sine x, cosine x, sine y, cosine y. And the middle two terms, or the inside two terms, sine of x times sine of y times cosine x, cosine y, and make sure you have the negative sign, will be negative sine of x, sine of y, cosine of x, cosine of y. And if you multiply the last two terms, negative sine of x, sine of y, times sine of x, sine of y, that would be negative sine of x times sine of x, that's negative sine squared of x, sine of y times sine of y is sine squared of y. So notice, the middle two terms after we use the FOIL method are actually opposites of one another. We have sine of x, cosine x, sine y, cosine y, and then we also have subtract sine x, sine y, cosine x, cosine y. They're identical, just opposite signs. So they actually cancel out because that just adds to zero, and so we only have two terms left. We have cosine squared of x, cosine squared of y, and then subtract sine squared of x and sine squared of y. Well, keep in mind what we're trying to show. We're trying to show that this left-hand side of the identity will actually simplify to cosine squared of x, subtract sine squared of y. They're actually equivalent. So notice we're trying to get sine squared of y involved, and we only have sine squared of y in the second term, but it's being multiplied by sine squared of x. Since cosine squared of y is not in the right-hand side of this trigonometric identity, we need to replace it. So cosine squared of y, let's replace it using the Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared of y is equal to 1 subtract sine squared of y, because sine squared of y plus cosine squared of y is equal to 1. That means cosine squared of y is 1 subtract sine squared of y, after you subtract sine squared of y on both sides of the equation. So we have cosine squared of x times the quantity that we're replacing cosine squared of y with. It'll be the quantity 1 subtract sine squared of y. And now let's do the exact same thing to the other term. Notice you have a cosine squared of y on the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity, but you don't have sine squared of x. You only have a sine squared of y. So we need to replace this sine squared of x in the same way. Sine squared of x will be replaced using the Pythagorean identity with 1 subtract cosine squared of x. So we have a negative sign in front of the second term, so it'll be a negative, and then sine squared of x will be replaced with 1 subtract cosine squared of x in parentheses, and we'll keep sine squared of y exactly as it is. And so now, if you distribute, you'll have cosine squared of x times 1, that's cosine squared of x. Cosine squared of x times negative sine squared of y will be negative sine squared of y, cosine squared of x. And also distribute the sine squared of y through the set of parentheses. And also keep in mind there's a negative sign out in front. So sine squared of y times 1 will give you negative sine squared of y because of the negative out in front. And also sine squared of y times negative cosine squared of x. And then also the negative out in front will make it plus sine squared of y times cosine squared of x. And so the second term and the fourth term are actually like terms, but they're opposite signs. One's positive and one's negative. So sine squared of y, cosine squared of x, subtract sine squared of y, cosine squared of x. They're actually opposites, so that adds up to zero. And so what's left over is cosine squared of x from the first term, and the third term is a minus sine squared of y. So cosine squared of x, subtract sine squared of y, and that's exactly the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. So this actually proves the trigonometric identity. We start with cosine of the quantity x plus y times the cosine of the quantity x subtract y. We use the addition and subtraction formulas for the cosine function, and we actually came up with the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. Cosine squared of x, subtract sine squared of y. So let's try something a little different. 
In the next example, we're going to use the typical addition and subtraction formulas in determining the difference quotient for a basic trigonometric function. So example five, we're going to use an identity from calculus. Suppose that the function f of x is the sine function, sine of x, and show the following trigonometric identity involving the difference quotient that we've seen earlier. The difference quotient, remember, is f of the quantity x plus h, subtract f of x, so that's a difference in the numerator, and you divide by h, which makes it a quotient. And so we want to establish this identity involving the difference quotient. It's exactly this right-hand side of the identity. It's sine of x times the quantity, cosine of h, subtract 1, all divided by h, plus cosine of x times the quantity, sine of h divided by h. So we're going to use the addition formula for the sine function to actually establish this trigonometric identity. So let's start with the left-hand side of the identity involving the difference quotient. We have f of x plus h, subtract f of x, all divided by h. Well, since our function is f of x is the sine function, sine of x, f of x plus h would be sine, take the x and replace it with x plus h, so it makes it sine of x plus h, and then subtract the original function f of x. Well, our function was sine of x, so it would be sine of x plus h, and then subtract sine of x. That's the numerator of the difference quotient, and then we have division by h in the denominator, and so this is the difference quotient that we need to simplify. We have sine of x plus h, that's a sum in the argument of the sine function. So we can use the addition formula for the sine function. Sine of x plus h is sine of x, cosine of h, plus cosine of x, sine of h. So that's what the addition formula actually is. It's sine of x, cosine of h, plus cosine of x, sine of h, and let's keep sine of x exactly as it is. So subtract sine of x also in the numerator, and the denominator will just stay h in the difference quotient. So notice what we have. We have sine of x, cosine of h. So we have a sine of x in the first term, and we also have a sine of x in the last term. We actually can group those two terms together in one fraction. So sine of x, cosine of h, subtract sine of x will make up the numerator of one fraction, all divided by h. And the other fraction will be the other term that's left over, cosine of x, sine of h will be in the numerator and we'll divide by h. So we're taking this one large fraction with three terms and we're rewriting it into two fractions where sine of x, cosine of h, subtract sine of x make up the numerator of the first fraction and cosine of x, sine of h make up the numerator of the second fraction. And each fraction is divided by h which is the least common denominator. Now the reason why we actually group sine of x, cosine of h, subtract sine of x in the first fraction is because sine of x is actually in common. We can factor it out as the greatest common factor. So if we factor out sine of x from the first term, we'll have a cosine of h left over. If we factor out sine of x from sine of x, we'll have a negative one left over. And so we have sine of x times the quantity, cosine of h, subtract one, all divided by the common denominator, which was h. And the second fraction, we'll just keep it the same. Cosine of x times sine of h divided by h, we'll just leave it exactly as it is. Well, let's see what we're trying to establish. We're trying to find out that the difference quotient can be written as sine of x times the quantity, cosine of h minus one all over h, plus cosine of x times the quantity sine of h divided by h. Well, we're almost there. We have sine of x times cosine of h minus one divided by h. Well, let's put the sine of x by itself and then multiply by cosine of h minus one all over h. So that matches the first term in the difference quotient, sine of x times cosine of h, subtract one, all divided by h. And then also in the second fraction, let's separate the cosine of x from the sine of h divided by h in the same way. So cosine of x times the fraction sine of h divided by h, and that's exactly the second term in the difference quotient. And so this establishes the trigonometric identity. The difference quotient, f of x plus h, subtract f of x, all divided by h, when your function f of x is the sine function, actually can be rewritten using the addition formula for the sine function as sine of x, times the fraction cosine of h subtract one all over h plus cosine of x times the fraction sine of h divided by h. So now let's talk about evaluating expressions involving inverse trigonometric functions. So expressions involving trigonometric functions and their inverses also arise within calculus. In the next examples, we're going to show how to evaluate such expressions. So in example six, simplifying an expression involving inverse functions. Write the expression for sine of the quantity, inverse cosine of x, plus inverse tangent of y, as an algebraic expression in terms of x and y, where x is actually between negative one and one, including the endpoints, and y is any real number. 
So let's start with the trigonometric expression. We have sine of the quantity, inverse cosine of x, plus inverse tangent of y. It's actually a sum inside the sine function. So we can use the addition formula for the sine function to actually rewrite this into a simpler form. We have sine of one term plus a second term. Well, the addition formula for the sine function said it's sine of the first value or the first term, so it's sine of inverse cosine of x times cosine of the second term, so cosine of inverse tangent of y, plus, because it's the addition formula for the sine function, sine of the second term, so sine of inverse tangent of y, times cosine of the first term, so it would be cosine of cosine inverse of x. So let's rewrite this trigonometric expression to be an algebraic expression in terms of x and y. And this is how we're going to do that. We're going to call inverse cosine of x, we're going to call that theta. So theta will be inverse cosine of x, which means cosine of theta is equal to x. That was the definition of the inverse cosine function. If theta is inverse cosine of x, that means cosine of theta is equal to x. And we can rewrite x as a fraction, it's x divided by 1. So cosine of theta, we know from right triangle trigonometry, is actually adjacent side divided by hypotenuse side. And so we can rewrite x as x over 1, so that means adjacent side will be x in a right triangle, and the hypotenuse will have length 1. So let's draw a reference triangle in quadrant 1. So this angle theta will represent this angle of the right triangle. The adjacent side to theta we know will be x, and the hypotenuse will be 1. If we want to find out the length of the missing side, we'll call it b, and we can find out an algebraic expression for b. So the length of one side squared, so x squared, plus the length of this side squared, so b squared, is equal to the length of hypotenuse squared. So x squared plus b squared is equal to 1 squared. Well, we want to try to get b by itself so we can find out an expression for the side b. So subtract x squared to the right side of the equation. So b squared is equal to 1, subtract x squared. And now if you want to get b by itself, take the square root on both sides of the equation. Remember the plus or minus because you're taking a square root to cancel out a square power. So b is equal to plus or minus square root of 1 subtract x squared. However, b was actually a vertical distance above the x-axis because our angle was actually in quadrant 1. And so b will be a positive value. It's positive square root 1 subtract x squared. So that's the side that's opposite the angle theta in this reference triangle. So let's go back to the original problem. We want to find out what is sine of inverse cosine of x. Well, if we let theta be inverse cosine of x, that means we're trying to find out what is sine of theta. So sine of inverse cosine of x becomes sine of theta. Well, with right triangle trigonometry, we know that sine of an angle theta is the opposite side divided by the length of the hypotenuse. Well, in terms of this angle theta that we have in quadrant 1, our opposite side we just found out was the square root of 1 subtract x squared. That was a side b, which was opposite angle theta. And the hypotenuse had length 1 in this right triangle. And so the sine of theta will be square root 1 subtract x squared all divided by 1, or it just simplifies to be square root 1 subtract x squared. So our first algebraic expression for the sine of inverse cosine of x is actually equal to square root of 1 subtract x squared. And also notice, if we have inverse cosine of x equal theta, then we would have cosine of theta for this last expression. Cosine of cosine inverse of x actually becomes cosine of theta. Well, cosine of theta was just x. So cosine of cosine inverse of x just becomes x. So it takes care of two trigonometric expressions. We found out an expression for sine of cosine inverse of x, and also an expression for cosine of cosine inverse of x. Well, we have two expressions left to replace to be an algebraic expression. We want to find out what is cosine of inverse tangent of y, and also sine of inverse tangent of y. Well, each of them involve inverse tangent of y. So let's do a similar thing. Let's call theta inverse tangent of y this time. So if theta is inverse tangent of y, that means tangent of theta is equal to y by the definition of the inverse function, and we can rewrite y as a fraction. It's y divided by 1. And now we're going to draw a right triangle, a reference triangle in quadrant 1 that's going to represent this angle theta. The opposite side we know will be y because tangent of theta is opposite divided by adjacent, so opposite side will be y, and the adjacent side will be 1 of this right triangle. Well, again, we have a missing side that we need to find. If we have the length of one side, that will be 1 squared, and we have the length of the other side, which is y squared, we can find out the length of hypotenuse, which we'll call c. So it'll be c squared. So 1 squared plus y squared equals c squared, using the Pythagorean theorem. And so we want to find out what is c. Well, since c squared is already by itself, c squared was 1 plus y squared. Now you can take the square root on both sides to cancel out the square power on the c. And so c is plus or minus square root of the right side of the equation, which was 1 plus y squared. Well, c was representing the length of the hypotenuse. 
that's always going to be positive. So C will be square root of 1 plus y squared. So that's the length of the hypotenuse. Square root 1 plus y squared is C. Well, now let's go back to the original problem. We want to find out what is cosine of inverse tangent of y. Well, we call it inverse tangent of y theta. So cosine of theta, where our reference triangle is actually in quadrant one, would be cosine of inverse tangent of y, which will become cosine of theta. We know that in terms of this angle theta, cosine is the adjacent side divided by hypotenuse. Well, the adjacent side was one, so that's the numerator. And the hypotenuse we just found out was the square root of one plus y squared. And so cosine of theta, or cosine of inverse tangent of y, is one divided by square root one plus y squared. And using this reference triangle again, we can find out what is sine of inverse tangent of y. Inverse tangent of y we call theta, and so sine of theta in terms of this reference triangle where theta was actually in quadrant one, we know that the sine function in terms of right triangle trigonometry is opposite divided by hypotenuse. Well, the opposite side of theta was y, so that's the numerator, and the hypotenuse we just found out earlier was square root of one plus y squared. So sine of theta, or sine of inverse tangent of y, is y divided by square root one plus y squared. So putting this all together, we were trying to find out what is an algebraic expression for sine of inverse cosine of x plus inverse tangent of y. These are the two terms that are being added inside the sine function. We can rewrite this as sine of inverse cosine of x. Well, we just found out that earlier it was square root of one minus x squared. So that can be replaced as square root one minus x squared times cosine of inverse tangent of y plus sine of inverse tangent of y times cosine of inverse cosine of x. Well, we found out each of these four different factors. Sine of inverse cosine of x, we found out was square root one minus x squared. We found out that cosine of inverse tangent of y was one divided by square root one plus y squared. We found out that sine of inverse tangent of y was y divided by square root one plus y squared. And we found out that cosine of inverse cosine of x was equal to x. So now just to simplify this expression, we have square root one minus x squared, times one divided by square root one plus y squared. We can make this one fraction. It'll be square root one minus x squared in the numerator, and the denominator is square root one plus y squared. And then the second term, we have x times y in the numerator, and the denominator is also square root one plus y squared. And now notice you have an LCD, or least common denominator, of square root one plus y squared. It's in common with both fractions, and so you can add the numerators together. So square root one minus x squared plus x times y, all divided by the common denominator of square root one plus y squared. This is an algebraic expression to represent sine of inverse cosine of x plus inverse tangent of y. So occasionally, when an application appears that includes a right triangle, we may think that solving is a matter of applying the Pythagorean theorem. That might be partially true, but it depends on what type of problem you're actually being asked and what information is given as we're going to encounter in the next example. So let's finish up with example seven, investigating a guy wire problem. For a climbing wall, a guy wire, R, is attached 47 feet high on a vertical pole, Added support is provided by another guy wire, S, attached 40 feet above the ground on the same pole. If the wires are attached to the ground 50 feet from the pole, find the angle alpha between the wires. So notice that we have two cables attached to the same pole. We have angle alpha as the angle between the two cables. One cable is represented as S and the other cable is represented as R. And we're trying to find out what is the angle alpha that actually is the angle between these two cables formed between cable S and cable R. Each of the cables are attached to the ground, which is 50 feet from the pole. Guy wire R is attached 47 feet high on the vertical pole, and guy wire S is attached 40 feet from the ground on the pole. So even though we're trying to find out the angle alpha that's formed between guy wires R and S, we need to find out what is this angle between guy wire R and the ground. So we're going to call that angle beta. So the adjacent side and the opposite sides are known for the angles beta and also the angle beta subtract alpha, which is the angle that we have here after you subtract off the angle alpha. It would be this angle beta subtract alpha. So notice we actually have two right triangles, a right triangle for the angle beta and a right triangle for the angle beta minus alpha. So we're gonna use right triangle trigonometry. Notice that we have the opposite side of beta and also the opposite side of beta subtract alpha, the two different heights of the guy wires, R and S, 47 feet and 40 feet. And we also have the adjacent side, both guy wires are attached to the ground 50 feet from the pole. So we can use the tangent function. The tangent function of the angle beta is 47 feet divided by the adjacent side, which is 50 feet. And then tangent of the angle beta subtract alpha is 40 feet is the opposite side, 
and the adjacent side is 50. So it would be 40 divided by 50, which reduces to 4 fifths. However, notice that you actually have tangent of a difference of two different angles, beta subtract alpha. So beta minus alpha is the argument of the tangent function. We can use a difference formula for the tangent function now. Tangent of beta subtract alpha is equal to tangent of beta subtract tangent of alpha in the numerator. And then the denominator is 1 plus tangent of alpha times tangent of beta. And that's equal to 4 fifths. Well, we know what tangent of beta is. That's 47 fiftieths because that was using right triangle trigonometry with the angle beta. It was 47 for the opposite side and 50 for the adjacent side. So we can replace tangent of beta with 47 fiftieths. And we also can replace tangent of beta in the denominator also with 47 fiftieths. And now notice we actually have an equation now because tangent of alpha is both in the numerator and denominator. So we can cross multiply because these two fractions are actually equal to one another. 47 fiftieths subtract tangent of alpha times 5. So 5 times the quantity. 47 fiftieths subtract tangent of alpha, the numerator of the first fraction, is equal to 4 times the denominator of the fraction, so 4 times the quantity, 1 plus 47 fiftieths times tangent of alpha. So remove the parentheses by distributing, so you can take 5 times 47 fiftieths, that is 47 over 10, after you simplify the fraction, and then 5 times the negative tangent of alpha is minus 5 tangent of alpha on the left side of the equation, and on the right side of the equation you have 4 times 1, that's 4, 4 times 47 fiftieths, that's 94 divided by 25 after you simplify the fraction. And then you also have tangent of alpha. So notice that you can get tangent of alpha by itself on one side of the equation. So let's add 5 tangent of alpha to the right side of the equation and also at the same time subtract 4 to the left side of the equation. So that tangent of alpha is by itself. So that way you'll have 47 tenths subtract 4, that's 7 tenths, is equal to 94 divided by 25 tangent of alpha plus 5 times tangent of alpha. That will give you 219 divided by 25 tangent of alpha. And now get tangent alpha by itself, divide both sides of the equation by 219 divided by 25. And so tangent of alpha will be 7 tenths divided by 219 divided by 25. And if you have two fractions divided by one another, you can multiply by the reciprocal of the fraction in the denominator. So 7 tenths times the reciprocal 25 divided by 219, which gives you 35 divided by 438. And so tangent of alpha is 35 divided by 438. We want to find out what is the angle alpha. So we want to get alpha by itself. You need to undo the tangent function. So take the inverse tangent function on both sides of the equation. And so inverse tangent of tangent of alpha, the inverse tangent and tangent will undo each other because they're inverses of each other. And you'll just get alpha by itself. But then you also have to take the inverse tangent function on the right side of the equation. So inverse tangent of 35 divided by 438, which will be inverse tangent of 35 divided by 438. Make sure your calculator is in degree mode because you want to find out the angle in degrees for this application problem. And this is approximately 4.569 degrees, or if you're around the two decimal places, 4.57 degrees. That's the angle between the two guy wires, R and S. It's about a 4.57 degree angle. So this finishes our video on the sum and difference formulas. We talked about how to use the sum and difference formulas to verify identities. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about the double angle formulas.